Hey all, special episode going on right now. I wanted to introduce a new podcast put out by a friend of mine, Jody. Um, it's the Mental Health Raw and Open podcast. It's You can find it at mentalhealthrawandopen, all one word, dot podbean, dot com. There you can find links to the episode. You can listen to it straight off the website, or you can find the RSS feed and whatnot. Um, Jody is a friend of mine who I've met on Twitter, and she is just fantastic. Uh, you can find her there at one last kick seventy one o n e l a s t k i c k seven one. She is a fantastic uh, advocate for those with mental illnesses. She's really an accomplished um, advocate. I keep saying advocate. That's the word of the episode, I guess. Um, you can find her always putting out uplifting statements and comments, speaking on her own mental health, uh, encouraging others to speak out on their mental health. She's uh, done a lot with Sick Not Week at SickNotWeek.com, which is fantastic. Um, I don't think I could go on and on. I, could, I don't think I could cover all the things that Jody is involved with. And I'm really happy to know her. I'm really proud of her for putting out her own podcast. And I want it to be a success. And you all can be a part of that by giving a listen and seeing what you think. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to run her first episode in the feed here in just a minute. And uh, hope you enjoy it. I know I did. I'm really looking forward to it. Her podcast is going to be a lot about... Um, interviewing others with mental illness. So, you know, getting people to tell their story. Um, and she interviewed me and I'll be on one of the episodes coming up, uh, which is awesome. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, uh, I hope you all enjoy it and I hope everybody is safe and well. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hi and welcome. This is the very first episode of the Mental Health Raw and Open podcast. My name is Jody, and I'm the host and creator of this show. I created this show to help stop the stigma surrounding mental health and to promote open and candid discussions about mental health. I also hope to let people know that however they may feel, there is always someone out there feeling the same thing. You are definitely not alone in your thoughts. Each episode, we'll talk with sufferers, caregivers, authors, therapists, speakers, and more about any and all aspects of mental health. We'll have a deep look into the issues that one in four people deal with and how having or caring for someone with a mental illness has affected their lives and the lives of those around them. I will be releasing this podcast once every two weeks on opposite weeks that I do my blogs, which would be at jodyb2016.wordpress.com or at sicknotweek.com. I will be issuing a trigger warning before each episode as some people may be highly sensitive to the topics we are discussing. I would like to thank you in advance for taking your time to listen and hopefully all together we can learn something new and open up the conversation and lessen the stigma. Since this is my first time hosting and uh, to be honest I'm a little bit nervous so I'm going to say please excuse any slip ups I may have and please excuse any editing errors. I am still learning the editing program. Okay, since the show is called Raw and Open, I thought that on this first little episode, I should share with you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a trauma-informed coach, a peer mentor, and soon-to-be certified crisis specialist. I am also a writer and mental health and suicide prevention advocate. So, since the show is called Raw and Open, I thought I'd better start with a little bit about myself. I am a trauma-informed coach, peer mentor, and soon-to-be certified crisis specialist. I am also a writer and mental health and suicide prevention advocate. Although I have been depressed for as long as I can possibly remember, I was not diagnosed until about five years ago when I was given the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, and general anxiety. Um, The combination of all these illnesses have literally cost me friends, family, and jobs, Um, and I am currently living on disability until I can find a better way to cope uh, manage my thoughts and feelings and hopefully get back to work. Um, I had a hell of a lot of trauma before the age of 18 months. I was in five foster homes total and four of them I was removed for neglect or abuse 
um, one specific incident that I vaguely have some terrorizing memory of is of drowning in the bathtub um, and that was confirmed uh, when I got my information from Children's Aid uh, probably when I was about 25 years old and that probably explains my strong dislike for having a bath. When I was 18 months I was adopted into my parents home. Um, everything there was pretty decent as far as I can remember until I was about five and at that point in time domestic abuse started to occur in my house on a pretty regular basis which led to me spending much of my time trying to comfort my mom and uh, reversing the roles really as I became a parentified child because I spent so much time outside of the house to escape the shit that was going on in the house I was molested from the age of 5 to the age of 14 by multiple perpetrators, all men, and um, ranging in age from 16 to 45. That was back in the 70s and children were not monitored as they are now. It was considered relatively safe to let your child go out and play for the day at the park without parental guidance as long as they were, you know, hanging out with a couple of friends. It was literally assumed that nothing would happen which unfortunately in my case was not the truth I was vulnerable I was young I was unattended and I paid the ultimate consequence for 14 years now uh, you got to understand this was back in the 70s and uh, basically what happened is every family liked to present a pretty picture uh, paint themselves very well from the outside but the insides were all falling apart and that too was the case uh, at my house there was no discussion whatsoever of the domestic abuse there was not even the possibility of me mentioning sexual abuse because to be quite honest honest I was too busy trying to take care of my mom and prevent the domestic abuse from happening and unfortunately I just could not do that no matter how hard I tried I turned the anger and self-hatred and shame and everything else that goes along with sexual abuse inward uh, as I had no outlet really so when I was eight years old was when I first overdose I knew what I was doing I perhaps did not understand the complete long-term consequences but basically I knew that if I took these pills I would be dead because that's what I had been told not to touch the bottle because they would make me very sick or they could kill me the event was obviously unsuccessful but it did land me in the hospital for the night and while I was there basically the whole mess was chalked up to a case of childhood misadventure um, there was no therapy there was no talking about it it wasn't even possibly in anyone's mind that a eight-year-old child could possibly attempt suicide and so at my home it was never spoken about again the issue was done closed and finished I started self-harming when I was very young as well um, as a method of coping and unfortunately I continued that pattern on and off till I was really about 40 42 years old now there were years where I was clean very long like eight nine years at a time but at some point in time I had relapses up until my early 40s um, I'm pretty well equipped now with a good toolbox of skills so I have replaced self-harm with numerous other things including tattooing which covers my self-harm scar and also prevents me from self-harming again now during this whole time the domestic abuse the sexual abuse um, when I was 13 my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer and um, she fought a very long and hard battle for six years unfortunately she passed away on October 5th 1990 and that day is literally burned into my memory like a tattoo. I find it funny that sometimes I cannot remember what I did or ate yesterday, yet I can remember every single detail down to the weather and what I was wearing on the day of my mom's death and on the day of her funeral. For those of you that know me or for those of you who are just getting to know me, you will find that my mom's death day is literally like the point that I separate my life. So my memories are either pre-death or post-death. That's how I have marked things in my mind. After my mom's death, uh, I wasn't really sure what to do with myself, so I traveled quite a bit 
through South America and uh, tried to run away as far as I could from my problems and my pain and drown them in margaritas and sun and sand. Um, unfortunately, I found out that that doesn't work. Uh, problems come with us wherever we go, unfortunately. There is no easy way around them. Mostly, you just have to go through them. So after the traveling and the partying and I had settled down, I'd gone to college and done two years at university. I still had no want or ability to deal with my past, so I just ignored it. I shoved it down my throat, and basically that led to two major suicide attempts and a handful of overdoses. Luckily enough, I survived them all somehow, but I still refused to go to therapy or take medication or admit that I had any sort of problems with depression or any other mental health issues. In my early 30s, I was still feeling pretty shitty, um, so I went on the search for a counselor, I went in search of a psychiatrist, and I went through about five counselors, and to this day right now, I am on my 12th psychiatrist. I finally found someone that I like and acknowledges me and is very understanding and empathetic. And so far, my working relationship with her has been fantastic. And I look forward to working with her in the future, um, learning some new skills and techniques, covering a little more CBT and DBT. Um, that's cognitive and dialectical behavioral therapy, which I am currently on a waiting list, which could be anywhere from nine months to 18 months long. But when I finally go, it will be my first group experience. So to say that I am nervous would be a very large understatement. I am not big on groups. I'm pretty good at talking one-on-one -on -one or one on a very, very small group, but put five or more people together and my nerves are shot. However, to heal, I have to literally try anything and everything, and this is one approach I haven't done yet, so the worst I can do is try it, and if I don't like it, I'll just stop. I am also on medication for my depression and anxiety. There really is no medication per se for borderline personality disorder. Often they will give you a mood stabilizer of some sort, so your bouncing around is um, less often and perhaps less intense tense, but comorbid with BPD is depression and anxiety and numerous other things. So the, I have tried uh, 12 medications, like combinations of different medications, and now I am on a new one, which hopefully is working a little bit better. Uh, I've had a really hard time with regular medications like the average SSRI. It just sets me off. I don't, it doesn't sit well in my system and I have a really hard time emotionally. So this new medication I'm on is in a different class of antidepressants and it seems to be working a little bit and have a lot less side effects for me. And I know that unfortunately, in order to maintain my ability to live, I will probably be on medication for the rest of my life. And that is just something that I have grown to accept with a little bit of time. In most cases, borderline personality disorder is caused from some sort of severe repetitive neglect or abuse in early childhood. Um, it actually malforms the brain in certain areas. The amygdala doesn't develop as well, which is the, the emotional center of the brain, um, which is probably why we are 90% of us are empaths, um, meaning we pick up other people's feelings. But the problem being is because we have borderline, we're all so almost like raw to feelings. Um, every feeling seems so intense. There's so much emotion because the rational side of the brain and the emotional side of the brain are not working together. The bridges have been torn apart or they were never built properly. And with therapy and neuroplasticity, we've learned that they can be rebuilt. It's just literally a matter of unlearning everything you've learned and then relearning new coping techniques and in when you do learn them uh, the neural pathways they form themselves 
So for those of you who don't understand or perhaps don't know somebody with BPD, um, it is basically like riding an emotional roller coaster 24 hours a day. Um, your ups and downs can be so intense and so rapid. Mood swings can happen literally 50 or 100 times a day. You're just bouncing all over the place with these unregulated emotions. You don't know what to do with them. It ends up in sometimes lashing out at people or um, for some people who haven't learned any skills, it ends in self-harm. Suicide rates are huge among people with BPD. The attempt rate is enormous as well. Many people with BPD will go through moods of elevation. They'll go through uh, feeling almost high, uh, manic almost. Um, I don't get that way. I, because of my persistent depressive disorder, I flatline and then I dip below the flatline and then I go back up to the flatline. And that happens for me on average, maybe 10 times a day or more if it's a bad day. It truly is really terrible to live with um, the black and white thinking so there's not much gray things are either this or they're that when in fact there are two truths but our brain is not yet able to handle them or put them together for me it also causes the constant need for reassurance which is something that drives me nuts I hate it it is one of the biggest pet peeves I have about having this illness and unfortunately it's not something that I have figured out how to overcome yet. However, that does not mean I have stopped trying. People with BPD also have a, a terrible fear of abandonment, whether it's imagined or whether it's real. It hits us like a brick wall. It hurts more intensely than I can possibly explain. Almost it would sound irrational to you because it barely makes sense to me. I do know that because of my past and not forming a nurturing bond when I was a young age, that abandonment is my absolute worst fear. Uh, it sometimes it doesn't matter how many times someone reassures me that they're not going to leave. There's still this nagging part in my head that's saying, you're going to leave, they're going to leave, they're going to leave, and, and not allowing me to get close to them, to open up to them fully because I'm so afraid that if I do that, that they're going to end up leaving and I'm going to end up getting more hurt than I already am. This in itself is kind of like a game of tug of war so it's very hard to get into relationships or friendships or maintain them. BPD people often become a little bit overbearing. We're kind of all in or all out and again because of that fear of abandonment if you get too close and we think you're gonna leave we actually push you away before you can leave because we feel that's a little bit of control that we may have over the situation however we really don't want you to leave and as soon as we've pushed you far enough away, we realize that and we immediately try to reel you back in. And not in a manipulative way, just in a way that, oh my God, what have I done? I didn't mean to push this person away. I didn't mean to say this. I'm full of regret and guilt and, and what can I do to make up for the damage that I've caused? Now I have learned and I'm still learning different techniques that allow me to encourage control that impulsivity. Um, simple things like if a text that comes through upsets me because I interpret it the wrong way, instead of picking back up my phone and texting something irrational and likely hurtful, I've learned to actually turn my phone off or move it far away from me, take it to another room. So but by the time that I get to it, I've had at least five seconds to calm down and sometimes you just need a few seconds to gain a rational thought back into an emotional mind. Now, even though I have a toolbox of new coping mechanisms, um, having a toolbox and implementing the tools quickly enough are two entirely different things. Obviously they have to work together, but it takes a little bit of time to untrain your brain to have that instant reaction that it's had for so many years and replace it with something that's actually positive or healthy and that works for you individually. And even with that toolbox, I struggle daily with depression and suicidal thoughts. Um, I say I've been passively suicidal for pretty much 40 years now. Um, and although on 
on some days the thoughts definitely get the better of me my survival rate is 100% so far so I guess so far so good I found a really fabulous mental health community on Twitter there's so much support there people with every different ailment and illness and willing and open to talk in an unjudgmental and safe environment I've met a lot of friends more than I can I could possibly make in real life I'm sure and I I've learned a lot from many people that I've met over the internet and luckily for me I have been able to make a few close friends that I can go to for support, judgment, encouragement, and a sense of safety. It is a place that even in your darkest of times, if you're really suicidal, if you reach out on Twitter and say how you're feeling, I promise someone will always reach back. The mental health community support is fantastic. There are specific support groups like hashtag BPD chat and hashtag PTSDI chat. There are also sites like sicknotweek.com and um, Michael Landsberg he does uh, videos every day mental health videos and encouragement videos um, to basically spread the word around and make sure people know that it's okay to be not well it's okay to accept that you're not well and just because you're not well that does not make you a weak person hence the name sick not weak anyway I basically just wanted to let people know that no matter how what you think you're feeling never ever think that you're alone in your thoughts because i promise you that you're not so anyway i'm gonna wrap this up i'm sure i have rambled on enough now and i want to thank everybody or whoever is listening for taking the time to do so i totally appreciate it and uh my next few episodes will be with Uh, guests and I'm really looking forward to those conversations Um, learning from them and introducing them to your world until then um, be well and take good care of yourselves